the message of modern science, Dr. Gerald Schroeder. When we live in the world trying to understand its, its origins and its development, there are questions that arise for believers, questions that arise for skeptics. I think it's useful to summarize at the very beginning these basic, these basic parameters, the questions that in fact shape much of the discussion. The first, I think, and the fundamental, literally the bottom line is, why is there existence at all? Why is there a universe at all? We get so involved in whether there's evolution or whether there's as, as, as an evolution. Is the universe billions of years or millions of years or thousands of years old? All these questions are, are totally secondary to the most fundamental conundrum of all, that of existence. We, the universe exists. It didn't have to exist, or did it have to exist? That's the question. Does it exist forever? Or was there a beginning to the physical universe that is predated by either by other universes or by something we might call God or the laws of nature? We bypass this. I think, I think Marshall McLuhan in his book, uh, The Medium is the Massage, states it perfectly. We're not sure who discovered water, but we're pretty sure it wasn't the fish. When you live in an environment that is totally around you, existence, and also cognition, awareness, self-awareness, you just take it for granted. We take it granted the reality of our existing, and we take for granted the reality of our being aware of ourselves to phenomena that may not be easily couched within the, or answered by the physical dimensions of the universe. Another question would be, was the creation of the universe a willful act, or was it the result of some random quantum fluctuation that the laws of nature might have pre preceded the universe. Biblical religion, or theology in general, would hold that some, some non-thing, in the full word, no, word nothing, some non-thing called God, non-physical thing called God, produces the universe. That would be a willful act. The, or, the parallel would be some non-thing, the laws of nature, as it were, totally abstract laws of nature, no physicality, might also be timeless. Religion says God is timeless, Physics could say the laws of nature are timeless, laws of nature without nature. The aspect of the laws of nature is couched within quantum mechanics. The physics of the quanta allows something to be created from nothing, provided you have a potential on which you can draw. Not a potential of anything physical whatsoever, just the potential of having the laws exist. So the question would be, did the, was the creation of the universe, the Big Bang creation, willfully directed? Was it a random fluctuation in a timeless entity we could call simply the laws of nature? Then another reality emerges from this, that the universe is tuned for life. The aspects of the universe are extraordinary. The, the quality of the, of, of the, of the fundamental uh, forces of the universe essentially shape the development of life. And in fact, they are, the universe is tuned for life. Not tuned for the starting of life. That's not at all clear. There's, we don't have any idea at the moment how, their, how life started. Speculations yet? Yes, but how inert matter became alive, that's a complete unknown at the moment. However, once life gets started, we see clearly from the fundamental con con constants of the universe that, in fact, the universe is tuned for life. How it emerged from life is a question that is a totally separate category of requiring an answer. Then the amazing reality is, is that life invented or conceived of reproduction. Why would any form of life think that it had to reproduce? It's alive. We know we're going to die. So you have progeny or you think, think about a world to come or another life after, that death might be just the end of, of the physical life and death might not be the end of life. It might be just a, a chapter, a change in the chapter from a, a material life to a totally uh, metaphysical or spiritual form of existence. Nonetheless, we realize our death, but did the first bacterium realize it was going to buy, die, and therefore that bacterium somehow developed the potential to reproduce? Reproduction is purpose-driven. It's not that it seems purpose-driven, it is purpose-driven. Reproduction, at the minimum, is the purpose of extending the life which is going to physically degenerate in the organism which is hosting this ability to reproduce. So why did early life have the first life? The first life which we know because any life that didn't have reproduction is gone from the fossil record. We don't know about it. So we just say the first life of which we know had al already within it the purpose-driven uh, reality, the purpose-driven phenomenon 
that it wanted to extend itself by reproduction. A major problem in this whole idea of, of uh, evolution is the fact that life starts immediately on the Earth. There are some basic problems, some basic problems in the idea of a, let us say, a neo-Darwinian or a Darwinian concept of how life develops. One of them is life begins immediately on Earth. Earth is molten, Earth cools, a crust forms on the Earth, liquid water and water vapor are now in abundance, plus several simple molecules, carbon monoxide, methane, ammonia, and then out of the rocks, water, life starts, not after billions of years, using American terminology, not after thousands of millions, th thousands of, millions of years, but it's geologically speaking, Im immediately. Now, obviously, there's a slack there of several millions of years, but the oldest rocks that can bear fossils already have fossils of fully formed, single-celled life. Nature invents photosynthesis in a snap and starts oxygenating the atmosphere. And may, uh, the rapidity is what's the, uh, the surprise. Then, a basic problem is, if it is the laws of nature and not God that produce the universe, then we have a problem because many of the theories which would allow quantum tunneling or quantum fluctuation in a, in a totally abstract, not material potential field, to, to compress itself and become a universe, many aspects of that theory, although possibly not all, but many aspects of that theory require the universe that is created to be a closed universe. That is, space will be curved to close back on itself. Not like a balloon physically, but that space itself co curves back in on itself. That means a super heavy universe. All of the data imply at the moment that the universe is not super heavy. In fact, it lacks in the visible region at least a fact by a factor of 10 the amount of mass required to produce this universe. So that makes a problem with if it is indeed the laws of nature. It may require some other understanding than quantum tunneling. Questions that a believer might have to confront would be, uh, why is there evil in the world? I mean, if God is supposed to be wanting to create the universe willfully, I would rather think that God wasn't some kind of sinister being that <laughs> you know, create the universe so there'd be things like cancer and people born, born crippled and crushed by earthquakes, innocent persons. So why does this exist? Biblically, there are easier answers for this. But a simple question is, why is there tragedy? Put it this way, why is there tragedy in a world in a world created by a God, from a biblical point of view, that claims to be merciful. I mean, why would a God that self-describes itself in, in the second book of, of the Bible, Exodus, then have in the first book of the Bible, one brother murder another, Cain murder Abel, if in, God, if in fact God is merciful? Those are, there are questions that, that within the text itself have answers, but these are, these are challenges that are presented. It, in th if, in fact, God does, in fact, run the world, so why were there dinosaurs? The fossil record from before 65 million years ago, going back to about 225 million years ago, is replete with dinosaur fossils. But why would there, as an example, if God is running the world, why would God have dinosaurs to develop approximately 225 million years ago? exist for 185 million years till about 65 million years ago and then be wiped out like that by a, what appears to be a massive meteor crashing into, this, into, the, into, the, into the earth. And there's a force from outer space, literally, a meteor, a force from outer space. If, you only, if indeed that force from outer space, that meteor, was sent by God to destroy the uh, dinosaurs and therefore allow mammals which coexisted with dinosaurs during that entire 185 million year span, mammals and dinosaurs coexist, which is a finding only about 15 years old now, that mammals appear in the fossil record at about the same time that dinosaurs do. But mammals didn't get any larger than a few kilos, whereas dinosaurs were all over the place, swimming dinosaurs, crawling, gigantic, massive dinosaurs, running, running the ecology almost. And then suddenly they're wiped out and the mammals survive. If, in fact, that wipeout of the dinosaurs was a divine effect, it certainly was good for us because we're the mammals that, are, that have seen to have come from that line. Well, why have the dinosaurs in the first place? Let's just move the whole development of mammals back 185 million years. You know, we could have solved a lot of problems by now. But the question that will remain is why, if God is running the world, have dinosaurs been destroyed? Then is the question would be, is the creation of the universe, is the creation of the universe 
produce a universe where life was merely possible? Or did it produce a universe where life was inevitable? We see life appears, just look in the mirror. But the reality, the question does remain, was that inevitable or merely, or merely a possibility? A major problem, is there any objective evidence for God's self-revelation? Is there any evidence that is, that is purely objective, that a skeptic could take and see that, in fact, there was a revelation by God? Th those data are hard to come by. The final question that a skeptic might present would, from a biblical point of view is the archaeological record is aston astonishingly deplete with evidences of this self-revelation. So now just to jump quickly into a few of those, to expand on a few of those, those questions about why is there existence. What, that's a question we can't answer easily, or perhaps at all. The fact is we live in existence as the fish live in the water, and if there were not existence, obviously we wouldn't be asking the questions. Then the, the, reality, the question would then be, but the universe that is created is so finely tuned, what are the implications? Well, we talked about this once before. Scientific American thinks the fact that the universe is so finely tuned is simply because there are many universes. Parallel universes really exist. There are many universes, and most universes may not have life. But our universe is just right for life, and therefore uh, we have life in one of the universes of the many that exist. The logic, which we talked about once before, is quite extraordinary. Scientific American, the article of why there are many universes, and here is the logic in one of the arguments. In four-color printing, so it shouldn't be missed by the reader of the journal, which I would think when you look at the logic, the editors might have been happier if, in fact, it had been overlooked by the reader. Evidence for other universes. Cosmologists infer the presence of, of parallel universes by scrutinizing the properties of our universe. These properties, including things like gravity, the strength of the forces of nature, the number of observable dimensions of space, length, width, height, and the dimension of time, those four dimensions, so that these properties were established by random processes. You have to get the mindset here. These properties were established by random processes during the birth of the universe. Yet they have exactly the values that sustain life. So Scientific American realizes that the most widely read materialist journal, materialist organization, or orientation, most widely read science journal in the world, establishes that in fact, yet these properties of nature have exactly the values that sustain life. What's the deduction from this from materialist, a materialist point of view? This suggests, since these values are exactly right to sustain life, that there must be other universes that have other values and don't sustain life. Hence, the cover can say parallel universes really exist. Well, that level of logic, since our universe is good, there must be bad universes, is about as convoluted as one can imagine in the uh, lo development of a logic of why there's a universe. Next would be on the... On the on this agenda of trying to just quickly go through this whole flow from a creation to uh, our existence. The Big Bang did not produce one iota of solid matter. It didn't, produce, it didn't produce protons and neutrons and electrons. It produced light beams, super energetic light beams, electromagnetic radiation. And these light beams eventually became alive. Now, it is quite a stretch of the imagination that light beams can become alive from themselves, but all of physics holds by that. Interestingly, there are ancient commentaries that hold by it also, but just stay with, uh, let's stay with the physics of today. The Big Bang produces light beams. Somehow, by the discovery of Albert Einstein, the famous equation E equals mc squared, the light beams become solid particles of, high, of quarks. They become protons, neutrons. We have electrons. We now have the building blocks of atoms. A proton actually is the nucleus of a hydrogen. These protons, neutrons, and electrons ra ra rapidly draw together. We get hydrogen and helium. There are some nuances in the process which lock the universe in after the first f three or four minutes to be primarily, almost entirely, in fact, hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen is great for making stars, but it's not good for making people. It just doesn't carry it off. You need things like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, iron, potassium, calcium, the heavier elements. So what happens? In the alchemy of stars, as the gravity pulls together, pulls together this hydrogen, 
and, and helium squeezes it tighter, tighter, and the hydrogen is used up, and the star implodes and explodes. In these, in these processes within the furnace of the stars, the hydrogen and the helium, almost like nuclear Lego blocks, are built into heavier, heavier elements, hydrogen, helium, lithium, barium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, up the periodic table, and the elements of life now are in the universe, made from the hydrogen of the creation, which was made from the energy, the light beams of creation. So now we have light beams manifesting themselves as the heavier the elements. These elements over eons and many processes and stars finally get drawn together in this corner of the universe. Sun forms at the center. Rocky planets, one the third one out, Mercury, Venus, Earth, just at, a planet just at the right distance from the sun to have a, 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 com a temperature commensurate with liquid water, not so hot that the water evaporates, not so cold that the water is locked in ice, just far enough away from the sun so the gravitational force of the sun on the earth doesn't lock the earth so the same face always faces the sun, which can be devastating. The moon's face, we only see one face of the moon from the earth because it's locked gravitationally by tidal forces so that it's, as it goes around the earth, the same face always forms it. Mercury has the same face facing the sun, primary, almost, almost only. Venus also, they're both too close. The earth just happens to squeeze just far out into a habitable zone where it can rotate on its axis, thus distributing the intense energy of the sun over the entire surface, has just the right tilt, of, an excellent tilt of the, of the axis, so that heat is distributed winter, spring, summer, and form, or fall over both hemispheres, has a, a, one of the largest moons in the solar system, which helps maintain the stability of this 23-degree this angle tip tilt that gives us so beautifully this distribution of heat. And on this Earth, which is so lovelyly tuned for life, as Scientific American points out, rocks and water, a few simple molecules, perhaps some clay, methane, ammonia, nitrogen, water, and rocks become alive. Of course, those rocks and water weren't always rocks and water. Before that, before the Earth and the solar system formed, they were stardust of previously exploded stars. And before this, they, they were the hydrogen and helium, which is produced in the Big Bang. And before this, they were beams of energy. See, everything you see around you is condensed energy. You're made of light beams. The fact that there was one physical creation, and science is unequivocal about this, there was one physical creation. The stuff that makes up your body and the world around you, the chair you're sitting on, the floor on which the chair rests, has been in the universe since the creation. You witnessed the creation of the universe. You were present at the creation. Not in your bodily form, but in the form of light beams that eventually became alive, learned to send people to the sun, to the moon, learned to create a, a violin concerto that can so beautiful it can move a person to tears, all from condensed light beams. It's quite a stretch of the imagination that this merely happened by itself. But that's the understanding from a mater materialist, reductionist point of view. Light beams became alive, and somehow, not only did they become alive, but they became cognizant of being alive, cognizant of awareness, of joy. Light beams can laugh and feel joy. Light beams can sing. Light beams can love. But that's what happened, because the only thing that's the, the substrate of this universe is light beams, and that's what we're made of. So the light beams became alive. I guess it could happen by chance. Certainly the New Yorker thinks so. Here's the picture, the famous example of monkeys hammering away on typewriters. Most of what they write will be garbage, but very occasionally you're going to get a monkey like this. See how happy he is? He's smiling. He got the Shakespeare sonnet. The famous adage, put enough monkeys away, let them hammering away on typewriters. Most of what they write will be garbage, but very occasionally, by pure chance, they will type out one of Shakespeare's sonnets. It takes the back of an, of an envelope to do the calculation that that will never happen, notwithstanding that the largest, the most widely sold science book ever written, Brief History of Time by Stephen Dawking tells us along the way that the whole universe can be done exactly like that. Monkeys hammering away on typewriters can, by chance, we can produce the universe. So much so that the New Yorker felt, well, we're going to get one eventually. We can take any one of the sonnets and realize it will take, it will take billions upon billions upon billions, about 10 to the 600th, in fact, 
years, universes, however you want to see it, to get a single sonnet. That means you have to either have a universe that was 10 to the 600th times larger, or that there would be 10 to the 600th universes, parallel universes, one's going to make it. In other words, the likelihood of getting a sonnet, at least on this uni by universe by chance, is zero. It will never happen by chance. So we have the origin of life that starts like this, and maybe it's by chance, that's what we're told, but it doesn't seem to work that way, because even if you think it's by chance, how'd the light beings figure out to send people to the moon? But they did. That life begins about 3.8 billion, 3.8 thousand million years ago. I'm using American terminology for the numbers. Life develops, not so rapidly in fact. It starts immediately, but remains single-celled for, for 3 billion years. For 3 billion years, life remains single-celled, and then out of the blue what comes what's called the Cambrian Explosion. This is Time Magazine, Scientific American talks about it also. In the terminology, the Big Bang of Animal Evolution. The Big Bang of Animal Evolution is quite amazing. Every, it's described uh, quite succinctly in Scientific American that every phylum that exists today came into being simultaneously. There are approximately 34 animal phyla. Every, all of those 34 appear in the, si si in the fossil record in a, in a strata called the Cambrian Explosion of which Darwin knew about. It wasn't dated. He just assumed that the, camp, the strata in which, in which every, every body type, in which every body type that exists today, not little people sleeping through lectures, no, but simply here's chordata. That's, uh, that's our first formation in our phylum. It's primitive fish. These are the first in insects, the trilobites. And they are mollusks and all, all together, all the 34, appear out of the blue 3.8 3 billion years ago. 3.6, 3.7, approximately 3.8 billion years ago, water forms, life begins. For 3 billion years, life remains one cell. Then out of the blue, the Cambrian explosion produces this menagerie of life. These are drawings from the American Museum of, of Natural History that I showed in Time magazine. In that life, already are eyes. Every phylum that has eyes today appeared in the fossil record for the first time with eyes. Now that's quite amazing. So Darwin assumed there were other fossils would be found that would show a difference. Well, other fossils have been found that it becomes worse and worse, constrained for these, these explosions of life, these punctuated li of life, and hence the journal Science, which is the leading overall peer-reviewed science journal in the United States, had an article in 1995 by uh, Robert Kerr said, did Darwin get it all right? Did Darwin get it all right? The subtitle was no. Darwin didn't get it all right that species appear in the fossil record with an amazingly undarwinian abruptness. What does it mean? It means we certainly don't understand what's going on, and it is interesting to see how we, one of the leaders, one of the leaders in, uh, in this understanding that life became by random reactions, how this person had the fortitude mentally to change his opinion. It's George Wald, Nobel Prize winner, professor of biology, Harvard University, wrote an extraordinarily interesting article called The Origin of Life. The Origin of Life, 1954, was based on the thesis that, in fact, life could start by random reactions. Scientific American, The Origin of Life, George Wall. Wall becomes a Nobel Prize winner for discovering the role of vitamin E. I think it's E, maybe it's A. Yeah, beg your pardon. In, uh, in, uh, in visual, in the functioning of the retina. Here's what he had to say in 1954. However, remember, water, first life, water appears here, and in the 1950s and 60s, the first fossils were only a half a billion years ago. So there are like three billion years of blank space in there in which life was thought to have evolved. How, so he's talking about these three billion years for the random reactions. However improbable we regard the, invent, the event of the origin of life or any steps that it involves, given enough time, it will almost certainly happen at least once, and for life as we know it, once may be enough. Time is in fact the hero of the plot. Get the hubris here. Time is in fact the hero of the plot. The time with which we have to deal is nearly two billion years. What we, what we regard as impossible in, the, in human experience is meaningless here. Given so much time, the impossible becomes the possible, the possible probable, the problem virtually certain. One is only to wait. Time itself performs the miracles. That's 1954. Comes 1970, another Harvard professor in 1975 and 76, Elso Barshum, discovers that the oldest big fossils that we have, fossils that you can easily see, do, in date, do indeed date only to about 600 million years, about a half a billion years ago. 
But the fossil record Barshun, Professor Barshun discovered goes back to 3.8 billion years or 3.7 billion years. But it's one cell. Before the Cambrian, Cambrian explosion, there are close to 3 billion years, 3,000 million years of one celled life. One celled, one celled, one celled, and then out of the blue, this explosion of life. And based on that, 25 years later, after 1954, Scientific American reprinted Wald's article with a retraction. It retracted the article. Although stimulating this article probably represents one of the few times in his professional life was wrong. Can we really examine his main thesis and see? Can we really form a biological cell by waiting for chance combinations of organic compounds? This would require more time than the universe might ever see if chance random combinations were the only driving force for life. Since 1979, you will not find in, reserve, in, in peer reviewed journals the fact that life started by random reactions. You will always find that a catalyst is required, a force is required, something is required in the environment that forces the life to occur. Wald, being intellectually honest and, and strong of character, in 1984, five years after the retraction and 30 years after his, his article about random reactions producing life, which led research off on a wild goose chase for about 25 years, Wald writes the following in an article published in the International Journal of Quantum Chemistry. The quantum phenomena has changed our understanding of the universe. And here, listen to his wording, it's exquisite. On his retraction, not of his article, but his previous thesis that the world was totally materialistic. This is the man that said time, in fact, performs the miracles. Notice that leaves something out. It has occurred to me lately, this is Wald, direct quote, in the International Journal of Quantum Chemistry, 1984. It has occurred to me lately, and I must confess with some shock at first to my scientific sensibilities. This is Wald speaking. And I must confess with some shock at first to my scientific sensibilities that the questions of the origin of consciousness in humans and the origin of life from non-living matter might both might be brought to some degree of congruence this is with the assumption that mind, that mind, rather than emerging as a late outgrowth in the evolution of life, has in fact existed always as the matrix, the source and condition of the physical reality. That stuff of which physical reality is composed is mind stuff. It is mind that has composed the physical universe that breeds life and so eventually evolves creatures that know and create, create science and art and technology, these animals, Humans, in them the universe begins to know itself. Had Wald studied a bit of his heritage, you might have seen that in Kabbalah, was talking about it for the last 2,000 years. But quantum physics caught up with it also. James Jeans, the mathematician. There's a wide agreement which on the physical side of the sciences approaches unanimity, that the stream of knowledge is heading towards a non-mechanical reality that the universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. Mind no longer appears to be an accidental intruder in the realm of matter. We are beginning to suspe suspect that we ought to hail mind as the creator and the governor of the realm of matter. Not, of course, our individual minds, but the mind in which the atoms out of which the entire universe has grown exist as thoughts. Werner Heisenberg, Nobel laureate in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics has placed the universe on a different footing. Quantum mechanics is part of, it's not some esoteric ob a theory on the corner in a shelf somewhere. Quantum mechanics allows your digital watch to work, allows your remote control to turn on your TV or opens your car to work. It allows your clock radio to work. It allows essentially from the time you get up to the time you go to bed, the theories and understanding of the quanta have changed electronics in your life. Werner Heisenberg, inherent difficulties in the materialist theory of existence, that everything is material, the material theory of existence have appeared very clearly in the development of the physics of the 20th century. This difficulty relates to the question as whether the smallest units of matter, such as atoms, of which we and all objects from bacteria to galaxies are composed, or ordinary, ordinary physical objects, whether they exist in the same way as flowers and stones, that you can touch them. Here the quantum theory has created a complete change in the situation. The smallest units of matter are not, in fact, physical objects in the ordinary sense of the word. They are ideas. Erwin Schrodinger. No, winner of the Nobel Prize the year after Heisenberg, both again for quantum mechanics. So in brief, we do not belong to this material world that science constructs for us. We, the awareness of being ourselves, are not part of it. We're outside, we're only spectators. The reason why we believe that we are in it, that we belong to these, are in the picture. 
and that is the only way of our minds communicating with them. The reality is there's a substrate that has allowed this phenomenal complexity to exist, that things like DNA itself is complex, but it's a closed book. The real complexity of life is not in the DNA. The real complexity of life is the reading of the DNA, of which, of course, the DNA is self-structured self to uh, develop a system that can read it. The reading of the DNA, the complexity of life, is overwhelming. The question is, from where does it arise? How did light beams manage to do all these things, let alone to wonder about them? Because that's what's happening. We're condensed light beams. It sounds corny. We're condensed uh, or, or poetic that we are con they're made of stardust, but we are. Five billion years ago, everything you see around you, including what you see in the mirror when you brush your teeth in the morning, was stardust. And it just happened to become alive. And that stardust was made of the, the initial elements of the universe, the hydrogen and the helium, and a few other elements. And those elements were made of quarks, and those quarks were made of the light of creation. The light of creation shines in everyone. You just have to let it shine forth.